So do you, do you like spending a lot of time at the visitor center then? Eddie said you're up there almost every day. I usually I like to go by there at least once every day and say hello to the visitors. Uh, I hope you see for me is what you get. I'm just plain old Jimmy. I'm not <laughs> anything special or anything. It's something that I enjoy doing, it, and I like to say hello and talk to all the visitors to see what they think about our products. You know, for many many years, you would make the product age it, bottle it, and sell it, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we do a lot of traveling, doing seminars and tastings. You get to meet the people that's drinking and see what they have to say about it, and that's what I enjoy so much about it, meeting the people and saying hello to them. Uh, just like you was talking about, you go to Australia. There were some Australian visitors over there right now, from a per uh, not from Perth, from Brisbane, Australia. We have visitors from all over the world comes here. And you finally get to see that other side of the fence then, I right? get to see the other side of the fence. Outside of Lawrenceburg. Outside of Lawrenceburg. <laughs> cool. I was born and raised here. I live within a mile where I was born and raised. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoy this episode with one of the last living legends. It's a big check mark for us. There's additional audio that you can only get by being a Patreon supporter, so make sure you support the show to make that happen. In addition, we did our Patreon giveaway this week. Four lucky winners were shipped boxes of small batch bourbon truffles from Art Eatables, who we had back on episode 60. They're insanely delicious, so go do yourself a favor, go to their website and order a box. I guarantee you, you won't be disappointed. While on their site, you'll also see that there's the 12 Days of Bourbon going on right now, where they have 12 different bourbon truffles made from 12 limited releases this year, including a 2016 Four Rows with Small Batch, and even a Pappy Van Winkle 20 year. So thank you to Art Eatables for this awesome giveaway. There's a lot of effort that goes into producing this show. The emails, phone calls, Google Hangouts, recording, mixing, editing, publishing, and more. It all takes a lot of time. The sponsorships we get through Patreon is the real engine that keeps this going. If this wasn't a user or listener supported podcast, Ryan and I probably would have stopped doing this a long time ago. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who supports the show, and we're slowly reaching the 100th episode mark. If you haven't supported the show yet, please visit patreon.com. That's P A T R E O N.com slash bourbon pursuit to learn more about all the cool swag that you can get, such as t shirts and koozies and everything like that. So I hope you sit around and enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan here again for our second installment here at Wild Turkey. So, uh, Ryan, what do you think so far? Well, the interview with Eddie was awesome. It was pretty raw and pretty cool. Uh, he, Wild Turkey's going to be in good hands with him, but I'm super excited about Jimmy. You know, we were just talking. He says he's nobody special. That's bullshit. He's, uh, <laughs> he's somebody pretty special, and I'm super excited we get to talk to him. Yeah, I think this was, uh, as we were kind of saying in the very beginning, very excited to have this. Uh, you know, Jimmy's a, a living legend. And we hope that you know we're capturing a lot of good things that are that are coming through here to to be able to live on for more generations beyond him to be able to listen and kind of get a lot of wise words, maybe some good jokes out of it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And maybe hopefully some cool story, you know, some <laughs> fun stories. So uh, with that, we'll introduce our guest to, to today. We have Jimmy Russell. Jimmy is the master distiller, former master distiller, current master distiller, whatever you want to say. He's a jack still, of all trades here at Wild Turkey. Still working every day. Yes. <laughs> so Jimmy, uh, again, thank you so much for taking time out and welcome to the show. Uh, so it's, I know you have a very busy travel schedule, so this is a, a real treat for us. But we always start and we want to talk about the history of the, the person behind the story. So kind of talk about, you know, your childhood, your upbringing, uh, life before even wild turkey. Well, I was brought up in a bourbon family. My dad worked at a bourbon distillery. Actually, he worked for the old Joe Distilling Company here in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, back when I was growing up, which was an old distillery here. Did you say old Joe? Old Joe. Okay, gotcha. And uh, then uh, in the later part of his years, he was working here at the wild turkey distillery. So I've been brought up around the bourbon. In Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, it's a small community, and it was uh, four distilleries in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky when I was growing up. And you had families working at all the bourbon distilleries, and it's just natural that you wanted to get into the bourbon business. You was brought up in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing around. <laughs> so kind of talk about, uh, you know, what happened to old Joe at that point? Well, old Joe finally went out, they went out, didn't go out of business. They went out of business at the distillery. It's another company that owns that old Joe brand now that's still on the market. Uh, another distillery here in Kentucky owns that brand. It's been a lot of consolidations 
of the distilleries. When I started, it was approximately uh, uh, about 27 bourbon companies in Kentucky, about 50 some odd bourbon distilleries in Kentucky at that time. There's all small distilleries. It's been consolidations over the years. All the brands are still out there, but they've been consolidated into to other companies and bigger companies. And we're, actually, we're the only one that actually say this. Everything here is still wild turkey products. We don't have any other products. Uh, it's all wild turkey products. Most of bourbon distillers has a lot of different labels, a lot of different brands coming from all the other old distillers around. Gotcha. So talk a little bit more about uh, your upbringing. Uh, so, you, you know, you're burned into a bourbon, your bourbon family. Your dad worked at a distillery. Uh, what about other family members? Mom, uncles, anything like that? Well, I had grandfather. A, I had uh, uh, uncles and uh, cousins and everybody working at distillers back in that day and time uh, when I was growing up. Uh, say it was four distillers here. And we and even today, most of us still have families working at all other distillers. In the still bourbon business, we're all close friends. And we do anything we can to help each other out. And if anything goes wrong, and all of us has families working at all other distilleries. So uh, still to this day, we got people here. Husband works here. His wife works for another distillery. We got a, a lady here. Her husband works for another distillery. So... It's a family affair, I call it, in yeah. the bourbon business. <laughs> was there anything uh, before you got started in the bourbon industry that you wanted to do maybe different than the bourbon industry? You know, really, uh, the only thing I think if you look back at my yearbook in school, I thought someday I might be a professional baseball player. I played sports. and what I enjoyed position? It. I played shortstop and when I was playing sports. Give Derek Jeter a run for his money. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, from a lot of the reading, you're kind of a regular old Jim Thorpe. I mean, you were baseball, basketball, uh, track, all those different kinds of things. I played all sports, football, basketball, baseball, and run track. So was baseball your, your kind of your clutch? You, like, you really think it was your favorite? Well, you know, to me, still to this day, I still love sports. But I'm football if it's football season. I'm basketball if it's basketball season. And nowadays, you know, when I was growing up, they didn't run together like they do now when – you started school, football season. Football season was over with. You started basketball. Basketball was over with. You started baseball and track in the spring of the years. Now they all run together, but they were separate back then. You don't have that opportunity now maybe to play all of them because they all run in together. Now you've got basketball, football, everything going on right now. All right, so what are Jimmy's teams? Who do you root for? Uh, I'm a University of Kentucky Wildcat well, fan. Yeah. Yeah. There you, go. <laughs> you don't root for those dirty birds. We'll, no. take, we'll take that. <laughs> what about uh, professional baseball, professional football, anything like that? Well, you know, when I was growing up, I was a big Boston Red Sox fan. Back then in that day and time, there was only eight teams in each major league. We have so many of them now, but it was only eight teams. In Louisville, Kentucky, 50 miles down the road, was a AAA farm club for the Boston Red Sox. And my dad took us there a lot to baseball games. So but when I was growing up, that's all I knew about was the Boston Red Sox. So uh, back in that day and time, I was probably – now I enjoy it. Cincinnati's one of my favorite teams now because they're close by in, in football, pro football and pro basketball. A lot of disappointments. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were the Bengals for a long time in football, and then they've become the Bongos. <laughs> that's now hard. they're back doing pretty well. They're doing better now. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll kind of move on to, to your your life now inside the distillery. So let's talk about what really made you come to Wild Turkey in the very beginning. Like, what was was there just a job opening? Was it union work? Like, kind of kind of talk about what what made you want to move into the the brown spirits business. Well, the same. My family had always been in the brown bourbon business, but actually, my wife was working here before I was, and. Uh, so you're chasing her around? No, I, we were like married. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. And uh, she she put me to work. <laughs> Joretta, my wife, I tell them she put me to work. <laughs> but uh, yes, that was uh, was the place I was looking for to come to work. Fortunate enough, I got on here in 1954. Been here ever since. What was the first job you had? Actually, uh, they called it quality control back in that day in the distillery, learning the distillery part of it. But you'd go get your samples of grain and things. You'd run the test on. Before the day was over with, you might be down with a scoop shovel shoveling that grain out of the truck. You'd done a little bit of everything back in that day and time where now everything's brought to the labs and to them and all. But we'd done just about everything back in that day and time. Anything to be done in a distillery, you'd done it. What was the worst job you'd done? 
I've never had a worse job. It's always, <laughs> I always enjoyed what I've done. Because he said it's not even a job, right? That's right. That's <laughs> right. So kind of talk about uh, some of the other roles that your family is, has taken in the bourbon industry. Like what was your wife doing when she was here? And, uh, you know, what was also your father doing? Well, my, right father, my father was head of maintenance. And he always told a story that if he didn't make the pipes leak in the right place, I couldn't make good bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife was in the administration in an office. Okay. So what do you what do you what was really the state of wild turkey when you first joined? Well, wild turkey was a up growing bourbon at that time, uh, and it's continued to grow and grow and grow. Actually, when I come here, we was making about fifty to sixty barrels of bourbon a day. We had about forty to fifty thousand barrels in storage. Now we're making five hundred sixty barrels a day, and we got over six hundred thousand in storage. So it's continued to grow. It's good for me. If we're still making 50 barrels a day, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I wouldn't have had a job. <laughs> but the bourbon business right now is strong as it's ever been. So how big was the operation back then? I mean, uh, how many stills? How many? Uh, one st- same as it is. Uh, our operation here has not changed one bit. We had a, a column still and a doubler, second distillation. Still the same thing today. Except to say we was only making uh, very little at that time. Uh, we, we go on bushels of grain mash per day. We was mashing about 1,200 bushels of grain a day. Now we're mashing over 4,000 bushels a day. Well, you're not scooping them anymore either, right? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so who taught you everything that you know today? Mr. Bill Hughes. He was a young distiller before Prohibition, and he come back and put this distillery in operation after Prohibition. And uh, he, li- he lived right up here on top of the hill. He lived right here close to the distillery. And, and he's one of those that, like I feel like I am, I wanted to do everything, you know. He done made his own yeast, and that's one thing we still do, make our own yeast every day here. We have our own yeast culture. But uh, he taught me everything. Most of the things in our business, especially in the stilling end of it, it chemistry, science, and engineering will help you. But it's so many things that I cannot prove to you scientifically. It's on-the-job training. So, so what, oh, I, I was going to say, what what is just – with technology, what has changed in distilling over the years? Well, when I started, everything was done by hand. You open and close the steam valve and the pump's going into the steel by hand. You pull the lever to weigh the grain up, close the lever when you got the right amount. And nowadays, equipment's got so much better. Uh, it's controlled. For instead of doing it by hand, you're sending uh, computers. Our com- We have a computer system now. They make computers that you could run this place from somewhere way off. But our computers, the way we got ours set up, we still have to have operators there. Instead of you sitting there opening and closed valves by hand, you can punch buttons when you get ready to weigh up your grains. Or when you get ready to start cooking, you can punch buttons and start, and you have to still be there and be right out there with it. But it's, that's the thing about it. And this is something you strive for. And I'll be, you gotta be consistent in the product you're making. If uh, when you're running your steel, you want the same proof all day. If the proof varies up and down, the flavors will be up and down. So with this, you know, you were human. You might be a little slow sometime opening and closing <laughs> a steam valve or a pump valve, where the computers will open and close them right now as it needs adjusting. Uh, uh, so it takes a combination of man and machine to right. kind of fine tune it. Fine tune it, yes. Mm-hmm. About what time do you, do you think that really the computers and the automation pieces really started becoming a, a critical part of the process? Because, you know, you said that really the history behind it is there's a lot of handmade and a lot of, uh-huh. a lot of I don't know, put, it, put the word artisanal on it, uh-huh. right? Whatever you want to kind of spin on it. Uh-huh. But at, at what point of, did you say, okay, we need to embrace this? We, well, need, to, we need to start looking at making this more efficient. Well, when, when the, the equipment started coming out, I say in the, sometime in the late 70s, early 80s, they started coming out with some of the equipments that were controlled better at all. And, and were you fully embraced of it? Or, did, or was it a hard sell for you? No, you said, it wasn't anything to improve he's like, your operations. You're better off, you know, be more consistent. That's what we strive for here with Wild Turkey. We want it to taste the same today, tomorrow, six months from now, or eight years from now when you buy it. We want our product to be the same. We want it to taste. I don't want something to taste one thing. You buy a bottle of Wild Turkey today, you buy one two weeks from now, and it has a different taste, different flavor. I don't want that. I want it to be consistent. I want you to remember it's the same same taste, same flavor that you did last time you had a drink of it. 
See, in, in my business, they say you want to automate as much as possible so you can take more vacations. <laughs> <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you consider yourself to be kind of old fashioned when it comes to the bourbon process because we're now living in a time where um, cask finishes are, are really starting to like pop up everywhere. Yeah. Well, you know, this is something uh, uh, that I've seen happen in my years. Uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, bourbon was strong. Uh, in the middle 70s, you young people come along, start drinking that white stuff, gins and vodkas. <laughs> I don't know about 70s yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're... Uh, you're too young. <laughs> but then bourbon kind of went down a little bit, and uh, we didn't change anything here. A lot of the bourbon distilleries changed their form of trying to compete with the lighter products. And even our federal government passed a law at that time that you could make light whiskey. It didn't go over. We didn't make any. And uh, Eddie, my son, he would tell you, Daddy's hard-headed and old-fashioned. He don't change anything. He probably told you that. I don't know. <laughs> and it's paid off for us. Uh, we stayed the same, and it's continued to grow for us and continue to grow. And now in the late 80s, uh, bourbon has come strong worldwide. Anywhere in the world now you go, the bourbon is strong. Overseas, our overseas business is huge right now. In the States, it's uh, growing leaps and bounds. Say it's, right now, it's, it's the highest it's ever been in, in production and what's being sold to bourbon right now. What was uh, life like for you before the boom? A lot more peaceful? Uh, well, no, it was, it, it's still the same. It's not any difference in it. You just have to make more. <laughs> Uh, the biggest thing we have to plan on here, most of your bourbons on the market is four and five years old. We're planning from seven to 12 years. So, you know, in in y'all's business, if you was doing a program now that you're not going to show or have on the radio seven years from now or eight years from now, what would it be? But that's what we've got to plan on all the time. Yeah, I can't even predict three months. From now. <laughs> I can't even predict the next quarter. That's what we got to plan on, you know, seven to 12 years from now, what people's going to need. So I want to kind of talk about some of the things that you've done here at the distillery. Like, what do you what do you think are, are your your golden stamps? Some of like the the big the big high like scoreboard check marks that you've done here over the years of maybe changes you've made or um, things that you've you've kept on and, and haven't changed because of maybe people said maybe Campari said you need to come and you need to change this and you said no we're we're put, I'm putting my foot down. Right? No, I've been fortunate. Everybody that's owned us, they've always told me. They didn't want to change Wild Turkey. They wanted to be made the same. I've even had the CEO of the company tell me that if they come inside to change this to save a little money, if I let them change it and it changed the taste of the product, I was fired. And that was the head man of the company telling me that. <laughs> and they've always been fortunate. I've been fortunate. They've always let us to make it the way we want them, like we've always made it, distilling at low proof, put it in a barrel at low proof, uh, using less corn, more rye and barley malt in our form, making our own yeast every day, where a lot of people went to sack yeast now, buying yeast, and, but we still do it the same way as the day I come in here in 1954, except we got so much bigger. <laughs> so I kind of want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of your old friends, right? Because you were best friends with some of the, the greatest minds in the industry, uh, you know, really before bourbon was cool and before a lot of these brands were really starting to make it out there. So talk a little about your camaraderie between people like you and Elmer and Booker. Well, Booker and Elmer and I, we're all real close friends. Uh, we're together all, all of us, you know, here in the bourbon country in the central part of Kentucky, we all live with an hour of each other. Even today, we're, we see each other some two or three times every week going out to eat at nights or a place like that, you know, where he lives. But Booker and Elmer and I, we were the three old ones back, and uh, we had great fun together. We enjoyed being with each other. And I was the first one uh, many years ago. Nobody was out in the field was marketing salespeople. And this company about 25 or 30 years ago decided that I ought to go out in the field and talk to the consumers and talk to our marketing salespeople. And that's the first time that I know of that any people from actual making it was out in the field talking to the consumers and their marketing salespeople where it always been marketing salespeople. And then Booker and Elmer started doing the same thing. And uh, I think done a great job in promoting bourbon all over the world and uh, knowing, let people know what it's about. Because I know when I first went out, it was all whiskey. It didn't make any difference what it is. It's all whiskey. They, nowadays, people are so well-educated, and I'm not good on these computers and things like that. I didn't grow up with them. <laughs> but nowadays, you know, 
you got the women's bourbon side of the world, you got the whiskey women of the world, men's bourbon side, so bourbon side is whiskey side, and they're on the internet. So they know everything's going on all the time. So it's, people are better educated now on what they're, what they're getting and what they're buying, and this is something that's really improved our business, I think. So talk about when all three of you would get together. Would you guys try each other's bourbons, kind Did, of figure out are there any secrets we can steal from one another? No, that that like wasn't Booker the same forces way. hams on you. <laughs> he, he aged ham. <laughs> Bean biscuit and country ham. That's right. And butter bean soup. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Booker, Booker and Elmer. And I, Booker was, uh, I think I always said he was a little, the loudest one. And maybe I was in the middle and Elmer was sort of a quieter fella. But we all had a lot of fun together. We was together a lot and meeting. And we used to, we don't do as much now because the older bunch is gone uh, I'm the only one of the older bunch. It has become one of the oldest bunch now, <laughs> 35 years of service. Him and Fred, no, uh, Booker's son. Mm-hmm. They grew up together. They've known each other. Parker Beam in Heaven Hill, he's in bad shape now. His son, Greg, all of them grew up together. If we was all together in the bourbon business, they've all grew up together, and they've been close friends all the time. So generation after generation is what I enjoy so much seeing about. But but uh, we'd get out together, you know, and we'd have a lot of fun have. And, uh, what fishing trips? Like, I, what kind I of never, things do y'all do together? I never was a fisherman. Uh, Booker was a fisherman. Elmer wasn't too much in fishing or anything. We were more just around the communities and all like that. But casual drinking buddies. <laughs> casual. And now we used to get together several years ago. We don't do this much now because we got so many younger ones in. Uh, once or twice, about one, uh, once to every month or two, somebody, one of the masters, still come to our distillery certain nights, certain time, bring your own bottle, but you can't drink it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, on the invitation, the last thing he said, the last and out, turn out the lights. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and now you're hanging out with Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey, he's uh, one, to me, he's, when he's been here, he's down to earth just like one of us, the way I feel about him. He's been just as, as plain as he could be around here. So going back, one last question about, you know, you and your, your tight-knit group of friends there. So kind of, kind of you know, bourbon aside, like not really just bourbon, but kind of just talk about the traits and the characteristics that, that Booker and Elmer had that you really admired. Well, Booker, Booker was one of these fellows, and I hope just like I am, Elmer was the same way. If they had a product and they didn't like it, they'd tell you right up front. They wasn't going to beat the bush around the bush about it. <laughs> Booker, shake your butt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we tell you the truth right up front. Uh, uh, so, uh, don't get me wrong what I'm going to say here. It's so many marketing spills now that really, you know, it's marketing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's marketing. It's, uh, but uh, we uh, we was always down truth of what we said and told people. And we believe if we, if we if one of our products, we didn't like it, we tell you we didn't like it. But Eddie will tell you, now when they're doing things, they'll bring it in for me to taste. And he says all he has to do is when I get ready to taste it, that he knows right then, well, just well, forget about it. Or he said, he's told people that, well, Jimmy, taste that. It's all right, but I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, what do you do that before you taste it, if, if Eddie's going to be like, we might as well just, just scrap this idea? <laughs> he, I don't say anything. That's left up to them. He's, he's my, you know, we were, we were the first ones to come out with a flavored bourbon. I don't know if you all know this or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but honey bourbons are just now hitting the market strong. We come out with ours in 1976. Uh, they asked me to come up with something. The ladies thought bourbon, unless they're from Kentucky, thought bourbon was too strong. And they want something with a good bourbon flavor or sweeter and all. So that's when we come up with the honey liqueur. We, it's our regular bourbon with honey and sweetener and flavors added to it. And it's a huge business for us now. And everybody's getting into that honey flavor. But we come out with it in 1976. See, that's a scoreboard mark right there, right? You say that's 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 part of the 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 Jimmy Jimmy uh, Golden Stamp right there. So uh, another thing, kind of talk about um, because between Kentucky, you know, sorry, should I say uh, Kentucky Spirit and Elmer T. Lee, both of these were were some of the first single barrels to actually come to the market. Well, actually, the first two single barrels on the market was Blanton's, right, and Kentucky Spirit, and then uh, Elmer come out with his single barrel. The first two barrel proofs on the market, when you say barrel proof, no water can be added to it. Whatever comes out of that barrel, you have to show it on the labels. And Booker's from Jim Bean, Booker Dole, 
and our rare breed was the first two barrel proofs on the market. Now everybody has them, but we that was the the barrel proofs we come out with the late '80s, early '90s. Uh, single barrels come out right after that. Uh, now everybody has them, but that's the growing market in the business these days. Is the small batches, single barrels, premium, and wild turkey's always been considered a premium bourbon anywhere you go in the world. And we've kept it that way. We haven't changed anything. A lot of the distillers say, I go back to the 70s, 80s. A lot of people changed their form of trying to compete with the lighter goods, and they lost out. And I didn't change. We, Another thing I've seen now, when I started, everything was bottled around 100 proof. You didn't have 90s or 86s or 80s, 80s is the lowest you can bottle bourbon and call it bourbon. By law, we come under federal government supervision. But the people started going down in proof. And now it's a huge trend going back up in proof. Nobody wants low proofs anymore. They want the hundreds, high 90s, hundreds. We want to taste what you taste. You get right out of the barrel. <laughs> and uh, this is what's really, now it's back going back to that. Uh, people wanting to hire, even in the scotches and everything, everybody, they're going back to the higher proofs. You think that's why Rare Breed has had so much success lately? Yes. Yes. So now that bourbon's really in the spotlight, uh, you seem like you're not hesitant to take a back seat even at 82 years old, right? No. So, uh, you know, you won't stop to continue to travel and talk about wild turkey. No, no as long as I'm set two feet on the ground, I'll do it. I'm here uh, five days a week, nine, ten hours a day. And I come out every Saturday just over to the visitor center to talk to the visitors. And a lot of times I, I, after church on Sundays, I'll come out after church, after lunch, and just say hello to the visitors and all. I, like, I consider myself a people person. I'm not any better than anybody else. I'm just one of those. Well, that's what Eddie kind of told us, that he was pretty nervous the first few times he had to speak in front of some people. And, and he, he, you kind of reinstilled in him that it's not, you'll, get, you'll get used to it, right? <laughs> well, I, well, I told Eddie when he, he first started going out, he can't be me. He's got to be himself. And uh, that's what he's, he's got to be. He, he's doing a great job for us now. But he can't be me. He's got to be his own self. And he's doing a great job for us now. So I, I guess with that, you know, now that Eddie's taken over and he's the uh, kind of doing a lot of the, the, the main operations around here, what's it mean to you as a father to be able to sit there and trust him with the business to, for the next generation? Well, you know, that's something I'm very proud of is, you know, you're seeing somebody following in your footsteps that's going to do keep on the tradition and all. One of the proudest moments in my life still get a little teary out about it. we have the bourbon hall of fame and uh, i've been in was the original member of the bourbon hall of fame booker delver and some of us were and uh, this is something that's nominated by the bourbon people then it goes for election and you're elected into the bourbon hall of fame and eddie was elected in the bourbon hall of fame several years ago and that's one of the most one of the hardest jobs i've ever done I, it's easy for me to promote one of y'all into the Bourbon Hall of Fame <laughs> induct you in. Oh, please do. But, no, I'm just <laughs> but trying to induct we got a way to go. <laughs> trying to induct your own son. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a hard job to do. Uh -huh. So this was a question from one of our uh, one of our listeners from Bourbon Nuga on Twitter and he says, Do you wish that the old distillery was still down by where warehouse A sits? Uh, well if it was we couldn't be doing the business we're doing now that distillery was built back in the 1800s and there was uh, wooden beams and all we tried to save it but by all the federal laws and all now there was no way it was it was old wooden beams it was notched and all it didn't and now we had uh, studded up the floors you know things like that but uh no it's the same thing at the new distillery the same size steel everything's the same except one thing where we had uh there's a few fermenters. We had nine 30,000 gallon fermenters and 15, 15,000 gallon fermenters. And that was, we couldn't build out over the Kentucky River, the main highway. And we had all this land here and it was just natural for us to go up on the hill where we had plenty of land and build a new, but the steel's the same size, everything. The only the thing, biggest change. Now we have 24, 30,000 gallon fermenters. That's, a, but everything else is identical to what was at the old distillery. Okay, so another question from Primo55, and uh, I'll kind of leave this and try to figure this out, but it says the eternal debate, uh, the cheesy gold foil 12 year or the split label 12 year? <laughs> this is something that has been going on for years. Uh, we, we had three or four different labels of the 12 year old product. We had the gold and the uh, cheesy gold and the split label. Uh, so 
and it was the same product. But people that swears up and down, all oh, this was better than the other one. <laughs> I've, I've heard this all the time, but it was the same product going in it uh, every time. So what was what was the best product that you think you've ever tasted coming out of this distillery? Uh, actually, every day. Every day? Okay, <laughs> that makes it easy. Yeah. So actually, we've done a few limited editions. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the top ones that won the top awards and all was American Spirit. It was a 15-year-old bubber been bottled at 100 proof because we had never bottled anything at 100 proof before. We have a limited edition, everyone. I've got to give you my personal taste. I said 7 to 12 or 13 is my ideal taste for bourbon. Uh, a lot of people think the older it is, the better it is. But to me, uh, actually, it's over at 13. So that white oak wood becomes a dominant flavor. You use the caramel, the vanilla, the sweetness and all. And the white oak wood becomes a lot of woody, smoky t flavors to it. In my personal taste, I don't like that. Now, when we do a 14 or 15, the oldest we've ever done was a 15-year-old Master's Keep last a couple of years ago. Now, with that, our storage buildings are seven stories tall, metal clad, metal roofs, windows. Uh, the top floors, it can be 30 degrees in the summertime, difference between the top floor and the bottom floors. The middle floors are ideal for aging. But when we do something older, we find a few extra barrels that we think is aging a little extra special. And we'll set them aside maybe 100 to 150 barrels. And we'll set them aside, we'll keep tasting them, and if it starts getting that woody taste, we can lower them down in that storage building and slow that aging down. And that's what we do when we do an older product uh, over 13 years old. We can move 100 to 150 barrels around to do that. We can't move 600,000 barrels <laughs> right. around, no way. <laughs> You're going to need a few forklifts to make that happen. And all you do is roll them by hand. They rolled it on rigs. Well, it still seems like a lot of labor involved, <laughs> yeah, right? But you wouldn't have enough room to... To move them around, we got uh, uh, 28 warehouses, mm -hmm. and uh, what we do here, we have some ages. You might go in a storage building here, you might find some that's a day old, you might find some up to 12 years old in that same building. We never put 20,000 barrels of one year in a building. If we had a fire or a tornado, we can't turn the clock back. If we lost 20,000 barrels in one year. That'd be a third of our business for that year when it got aged to sell. Mm -hmm. So we put a little of every year in all of our storage buildings. So if we lose something, some tornado, fire, we'd still have enough product to keep going. But if you put it all in one building, something happened. So kind of talk about, um, you know, you, you've always said that sort of the younger, I don't want to say younger age, but the six to eight year is kind of like your favorite range, right? And and Eddie's been experimenting and putting out a lot of things that are, as you said, a lot older, 15, uh, 17 yeah. years. So uh, kind of give us your thoughts. Well, that's, you know, that's uh, your younger generation. You know, <laughs> your taste buds is just like one of the big things right now. Rye whiskey is huge right oh, yeah. now. We're still on allocations on rye whiskey. Six, seven years ago, us and Jim Bean was about the only two making rye whiskeys. We was making two or three days a year. Let's say we make 560 barrels a day, but we was only making two or three days a year of rye whiskey. And the last, from 2009 up until now, rye whiskey's made a huge, huge jump. We're still on allocations on our rye whiskey. We can't get caught up. You know, ours is between five and eight years old, but we think, I think that's the best for rye whiskeys. And, we think we're catching up, and the first thing you know, sales <laughs> keeps going up on it. But, but that's the biggest jump that I'm seeing now is the rye whiskey category. It's really, really booming right now. I know there's a few of those those bottle chasers, bottle chasers out there, and they always say that that white whale is finding the the old wild turkey rye that has that said it's come from Maryland. Yeah, made in Baltimore. <laughs> but, well, you know what it was? When I started, it's like bourbon. Bourbon is a distinctive product of America. This is the only place you can make bourbon is the United States. When I started, if rye whiskeys didn't say Maryland or Pennsylvania, people didn't think that it's not rye whiskey. Because the first whiskeys made in the States was rye whiskey. The East Coast was dominant rye grain. And they made a lot of rye whiskey in Maryland and Pennsylvania. And people thought that's the only place could make rye whiskey. And then many years ago, it's all been made in Kentucky for 30 or 40 years now. And then when it got to Kentucky, corn was a dominant grain. And that's where the bourbon come into effect. They started using corn in place of rye. Now, I say we're still heavy in rye content on our bourbon. But uh, corn becoming, it got its name from Bourbon County, Bourbon County. 
Kentucky over here, Paris, Kentucky is where Bourbon got its name from. I've, there's, there's been so many rumors about how that always happened, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's always it's always good to dispel something. Uh, so here's another question from the guys over at Breaking Bourbon. They said, if you're going to share a drink with anyone, past, present, or future, who would it be and why? Oh, gosh, that'd be hard to say. You know, <laughs> uh, so many people that... Uh, say with Booker and Elmer and I, we've had a lot of good times together <laughs> sitting and sharing a drink with each other. But it's so many people. I, you know, it's just I couldn't. So many I've enjoyed being with, and, and basically seeing how they enjoy it, sitting enjoying with them. And you know, it's so many many people all over the world that I've enjoyed doing that with. So Donald you, Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now, uh, <laughs> one of one of one that uh, Herb Kelleher. Have you ever heard of Herb Kelleher? I don't think I know. He was the owner and starter of Southwest Airlines. Oh, okay, yeah. He was a huge wild turkey, and he was a lot of fun to be around with to drinking wild turkey. I always drink wild turkey on Southwest. That's the only bourbon you can get on my Southwest. He won't put any other bourbon on on his planes. He's always, he's been a huge wild turkey drinker, and he's been a lot of fun to be around with. Or is that a a handshake that was done underneath the table to make sure that happened? (laughs) (laughs) So there's a, a another kind of famous quote out there, and they said, I heard somewhere that if there was going to be a Mount Rushmore of bourbon, you would be one of the first faces on it. So It's a lot of people said that. Uh, the governor of the state of Kentucky said that. A lot of people said that. Uh, How does it make you feel? Uh, you know. You just feel like you're still just plain old, plain old <laughs> Jimmy? Plain old Jimmy, uh, to me, yes. So I, what, what are some of those things that you want to leave as a legacy within the side of this industry? Well, I want to leave a legacy that... Wild turkey's always been a premium bourbon, stayed the same way, traditional way, not changing to meet uh, short-term uh, things, you know, wanting to be traditional, continue on the same way from now on. And what do you what do you want to see out of the brand that can, is going to continue throughout those years? Um, just the same distillation techniques, aging techniques. Do you, do you feel that maybe a, you need to experiment with some changes or anything like that. Well, you know, we've always done a little experiment, and, uh, but it seems to always go back to the same old style. <laughs> it's for ourselves, you know, we want the same product day in and day out, and you can make a lot of changes. And, and when you're making changes, you're going to you're going to change the, your taste and flavor of your product. So, is there is there anything that that you think that you made a, a big impact on here at Wild Turkey that? People are going to look back, uh, whether it's um, your grandson becomes a, a master distiller here or anything, and, and he says that my grandfather made made this change, and it's it's always it's always going to be something that uh, people are going to look on. You know, say I haven't made any changes. <laughs> <laughs> he don't change. Doesn't no, I don't that. change. <laughs> I don't change. Uh, stay the same way, and say it's paid off for us back in the seventies and eighties. Most of the bourbons was declining. I can honestly say this, wild turkey never did have a decline. We maybe, maybe had a very little growth, but it's continued to grow all the time. It's always been a prestige drink for people. I, I tell the story, people drink when they're happy, they drink when they're sad. <laughs> maybe even more when they're sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. When they have money and they don't have money. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's sort of how it works. Uh, yes. I did want to ask, you know, with the boom, is there anything about the industry you don't like right now with what's going on with the boom? The only thing it has me a little concerned about coming out with so many different flavors. Mm-hmm. You know, vodka, when it first come out, they started all these different flavors. Mm-hmm. And to me, maybe I'm wrong. Say I'm fashion, old-fashioned, hard-headed. Uh, the vodkas, you had, about every two years, you had to come out with a new flavor. People, you know... And bourbon is getting hoarded a lot of different flavors. You got to have apple flavored bourbons now. You got different ones. I say, and I can't say too much about that because I come out with American Honey in 1976, <laughs> but it's done well for you us. You can say, I did it first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this is something that maybe I'm going to get a little leery about. So many different flavors coming out in bourbon. Is this going to be something like the vodkas where you have to have a different flavor every two or three years to keep, keep it going? Well, the, the way I kind of see it is that even the purists, 
um, aren't going to really fall into that, no, right? No, they're yeah. not. I think I think the only way that you know you get, as you said, even with American Honey, what you're doing there is you're getting some more inexperienced people to be able to try the product. Uh, I guess the the easiest way to put it is if you're a crack dealer, it's like right? a gateway <laughs> drug. Yeah, you, you give them their first hit, and then after that, they might come back uh, for more. Yeah, and one of the biggest things for us now in the bourbon business, I think, is the ladies. You know, my age, you went to a bar or liquor store, you never saw a lady in the bars or liquor store. You go to bars and liquor stores now, I say half of the people at the bars now is ladies. You go to the liquor store, they're doing all the purchasing of the bourbon now. Uh, This is some big change that I've seen. The same when I started, bourbon was considered a southern gentleman's drink. They got off of work in the afternoons. They got their cards, their cigars, and their bourbon went to the back room and played. Now it's become a worldwide drink. Anywhere you go in the world, bourbon is. Yeah, you're hanging out with women and hipster bartenders now. (laughs) Yes, the bartenders, they're the best salespeople you can have. Uh, You know, if I walk in and say, give me a bourbon on ice, well, if they got a certain bourbon they like for for the first time, have you tried wild turkey? You know, they're going to, they have a big influence on too. If if you you just walk in and say, give me a, a bourbon, they they if they like certain bourbons they gonna promote it for you, uh, but you know is uh, things about this uh, people you have uh, people come in they'll start well why you do this why you do that because <laughs> that's the right way <laughs> that's what yeah. I tell them <laughs> you, you know it's you can always say well that's just the way it's always been <laughs> it ain't changing yeah uh-huh. so uh, is that one of the biggest things you think you take pride in is just the fact that it's it's always just been consistent. It's always been the same, never veering away from your tried and true self. Tradition. Like that. Uh, one of the things we didn't even talk about, the barrels. We use a number four char barrel. That's the heaviest you can get. Now, when I started, all the timber, the staves were cut out in the woods. And they set out in the woods in a cob house, you know, air between each stave stack. Okay. And uh, for six, we like from six to nine months. Well, nowadays, everybody's looking at the bottom line to say, I've been fortunate here that everybody's owned us. I hadn't worried about that. They said, we want to keep it the same. And nowadays, they're doing a lot of kill drying. Oh, on, dry faster, yeah. aging yeah. faster, yeah. And now, ours are still stipulation on our barrels that they have to sit out in the woods for a minimum of six months. They're dry. Of course, the rain and different things, you leach in some things out of that wood that you really... Uh, You're missing need, out on them the other uh, other way. And uh, well, ours still has set out in the woods for six to nine months. And we know, we, they know we, we've we been dealing with that same barrel company for over 40 years. Independent state, right? right. Yeah. yeah. And then we've been dealing with the, uh, our corn fell over Baghdad, Kentucky, for over 40 years. And they know what we don't use any GMO grains. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. We don't use any of those. And uh, they know that. And they know if they send it up here, we're going to inspect it. If it's not right, it's coming back to them. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Do you ever get tired of talking about the, the same old thing no matter where you go? No, or is I it... enjoy it. I enjoy talking to people. And uh, i say the main thing, I get more out of it than they probably get out of me. <laughs> I get from the information from them. It, you know, if, if you're just here all the time, you wouldn't get that information. Right. Except somebody writing into you and know, all. But I like to be look you in the eye when we're talking backs and forwards and seeing what you think about it and everything like that. Yeah, I guess I guess one of the things that, you know, we've seen, a, I've, at least I've seen like all kinds of different labels that have been from Wild Turkey over the years. Uh, and, you know, you kind of said that it has like a placebo effect because it's always been like the same thing that's the same been in basics, there. basics, yes. Right, so I, I guess like why do, why, do people, why do people go crazy over some of the older stuff? I mean, is it, you think it's just real in their head? I mean, uh, I, I think so. So, so I've got a bottle of... Uh, 1970 i probably should have brought it with me i think it's 78 eight year 101 what? at the house so uh-huh. uh haven't even opened it yet because well, i'm, I'm about, saving I, it i probably should have brought it and had a, had a, had a that, drink with you that's a bird looking at you remember what i said now <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but start those eyes closing it's time to <laughs> start blanking it's time to <laughs> <Yeah>. quit <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh man! Okay. I'm one of those weird people. I I do think I don't, maybe it is on my head that the older stuff tastes better than the newer stuff. But yeah. I guess maybe it's in my head because I have a 
you know, he's, story built up in my mind, but uh, he's, he's got he's got a fixation. I think a lot of people do with like the old national distillers and all that sort of stuff from old granddad and stuff uh, back then. Uh, a lot of people a lot of people go crazy for it. Yes, but. you know that's one of the things. Uh, one of the, one of the top selling bourbons in the sixties was Old Crow. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and uh, when these light goods come out, they change their formula and all. And now the old crow sitting on the bottom shelf, and I'll, I'll make you a bet if you go to the liquor store, and the people that comes in and buys old crow are my age. Mm -hmm. You don't see young people buy it. Yeah, I, I haven't bought old. I don't, I couldn't tell you the last time I had. I tried old, to it buy. Had to in, it had to be in college when we were just <laughs> buying the, buying the cheapest stuff we could get. Yeah. Right. I did try to buy an old crow chess piece set. That, chess piece. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. Fred Minnick said it was one of the best bourbons, uh -huh. or, you know, he uh -huh. had, so I was trying to hunt one down, but uh -huh. I was, the guy outbidded me, so. <laughs> so I guess another question, you know, looking back over here, a lot of the, the decanters, so you guys were kind of like following or with Beam on the, in the 70s trying to do decanter type of uh -huh. uh, you know, style, I'm marketing? I'm not sure if we won first on that. Okay. We come out in 1971. 71, okay. And... Uh, uh, the first was eight in the series of uh, eight for eight years. It was a series of them, and uh, it was a limited edition. And then after that, we come out with a, a series of four bottle series, four years. And then after that, we come out with the the turkey and the, and the wildlife, the turkey and the coyote, the turkey and the fox, the turkey and the different animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time we done it was 1988. Actually, the first one we put out in 1971 sold for about $22, $23 on the shelf. The last ones we put out in the 80s, we was paying $60 and $70 just for the bottle. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody, Beam got big into them. Uh, uh, there was an old Hoffman distillery here in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. They put out more than anybody at one time. They had, the, I don't know if you've seen any of them not, they had the Huntsman's, the Indian's. They had all different things, and uh, they put out a lot of different ones. So, uh, and uh, but uh, I don't know when is anybody putting them out now. I don't know if anybody's putting them out now. It just got you don't much. need to anymore. Yeah, you don't need well, to anymore. It's, they're too expensive to. They put them in boxes, I guess now, but uh -huh. yeah, not decanters. Uh huh. Uh huh. Then we had the uh, rock or crystal decanter we put out. That's the bottle sitting there. Oh, the Christmas rye or the Christmas no, bourbon? No, the, the rock or rock crystal decanter. Oh, the crystal decanter. Okay. And then uh, we had the Wedgwood crystal decanter, which now you can't use them. You know what the crystal is, don't you? No, I guess explain it to me. I mean, it's I know what the, crystal is. Yeah, but, it, yeah. It, what's it made from? Oh shit, I couldn't tell oh, you. Wow. Lead. Oh, oh, gotcha. And so actually, our federal government won't let you fill them. Yeah. Well, there you go now. <laughs> yeah. So kind of talk about what your, the day in the life is now of, of Jimmy Russell, right? Now that you've kind of, uh, I don't want to say taking a backseat. You're not taking a backseat. No, seat, I'm not but, taking a backseat. But, but in regards of like, I mean, how, how involved are you still with the day-to-day -day operations of tastings and all that every, sort of stuff? Every day. Still do it every day. First thing I do in the mornings, usually when I get here, I taste a new product we just made yesterday. No, and, we, came, we came just a little too late, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. And, well, we... We don't want to spend one hundred and fifty dollars for a new charred oak barrel, and put a bad product in it. Uh, we want to make sure it meets our standards before we put it in that. We also want to inspect the barrels to make sure that I don't do that, but I do the taste of the new product, and uh, walk around the fermenters. With so many years that I've been in the business, I can look at a fermenter and tell you whether something wrong or not with <laughs> it. You know how the patterns and all are on it, and you can sense it really. Yes. Mm -hmm. Look at them. Talk to operators the night shift. Uh, what if anything happened during the night or anything like that? And then uh, go over to bottling, see how bottling's going on. Just going around. Make your loops. Make loops. <laughs> so, how has the, the success of of bourbon and wild turkey uh, affected you by by seeing the growth that's happening? Whether it's the community or just the distillery in general. Uh, it's a, it's a whole world to me. So you're reaching the whole world now with Kentucky bourbons. Anywhere you go in the world, Kentucky's famous for their bourbons. Anywhere you go, and that's something that, that I enjoy seeing. Where, where's the where's your favorite place you've ever been? 
That's, besides, that's, besides Lawrenceburg. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's a hard question to ask. The two foreign countries that I really enjoy going to, I like all of them, but Japan and Australia, and they're just opposites. Japan is very formal about everything. Uh, Australia it likes to have a lot of fun. <laughs> but uh, that's two f uh, favorite places. But I enjoy going to Europe and different places. But that probably if I'd have to say Japan and Australia would be my two most favorite places. And they're big on wild turkey bourbon, both of them. Uh, people say because they're big on wild turkey, but no, I enjoy the company over there with them. They say you're a man that, that doesn't have jet lag. You don't. He shakes your sacred right now. <laughs> uh, well, when I first started flying, you didn't have flight attendants. You had a stewardess. There's all ladies. And one of them told me one time, done a lot of flying, uh, drink plenty of liquid water, get up and walk. If you're on long trips, get up and walk ever so often and all. And it really has never bothered me. And the main thing for me is if I'm going to Australia, which is 15 hours ahead of us right now. If, when I leave LA, that's where I usually fly out of LA to Sydney or places, I put my time on their time right then. I don't even think about this time unless I'm trying to call back home. But a lot of people tries to stay on their own time and, and to me, but I go right on the time about wherever I'm going, even going to West Coast. As soon as I leave here, if I'm going to California, I run my watch back three hours get on that time and stay on it uh, because what will happen to you I know going to Australia when I first started going over there uh, we, I got in there about 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning they wanted you to go to bed and sleep and then go out that night well I don't I stay up because if I went to bed that morning and went to sleep woke up in the afternoon I go to bed that night I couldn't sleep so I stay now sometimes you know, times that 35, 40 hours you've been up, besides what a little sleep on the plane, you're ready to go to bed that night. It's get right on that, wherever you're going, get on that time and stay on it. That's what you need to do to me. That's what's helped me so much. Pro tips from Jimmy Russell here. That's right, <laughs> travel trips. So I guess another question is, you know, regards of when did when did the, the travel really start picking up for you? About like how many years ago was it, Was did your role really change from uh, – being behind the scenes to now being in front of everybody and traveling all the time. 25, 30 years ago when they first sent me out to save, I was all marketing salespeople at that time. Now everybody in the bourbon business has somebody out. Now most of them are ambassadors, but us, Nady, uh, Craig Beam, Fred No, they've all started out in production. They've, they've been in the making part of it. A lot of them are ambassadors. It's out doing it now, but uh, this is something uh, you go out, they'll say, well, well, he knows what he's talking about. He's actually made it. Uh, this is something that impresses me a lot. Would you enjoy more making it or talking and meeting people? Both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> and drinking it. <laughs> they drink it. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> so I guess on the, on the drinking it part, you know, Booker had a, had a he thing, you know, he's called the Kentucky Chew. So yeah. kind of talk about your process well, that's of, of same, tasting. We both all say, I say you give them that good old Kentucky, roll it around all over your mouth and get the true flavors and all. The things that I really look for is first is the color. Bourbon is the only product in the world that you cannot add color to. It has to be a natural color. You want a good, rich, deep, amber, bright color to it. But the most important thing to me is the nose, the aroma. And I use simple terms explaining to people. If you want to be technical, I can get there. But if you walk into a restaurant... Let's get what, technical. Get technical. <laughs> but if you walk into a restaurant, what's the first impression you get of the food? The smell. The, the smell, the aroma. If it doesn't smell good, I don't care how good it tastes, you don't say, it's not any good. Same way in bourbon, you ought to get that... I'm giving the basics, the caramel, the vanilla, the sweetness, the fruity. You ought to get that same aroma. And I like to smell with my mouth closed, and then smell again with my mouth open. Get all the flavors. And then put it in your mouth and give it that good old Kentucky chew, get the flavors all over you. And then the last thing that I look for is the finish. What kind of taste does it leave in your mouth? Does it leave a good taste? Does it leave a lingering good taste in your mouth? If it leaves a bad taste in your mouth, you probably won't want it anymore. Probably not. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. pretty typical. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess how often do you – so you say you're tasting here every day. I guess how, how much are you tasting when you do it? What it oh, well, actually, we just taste a little bit and, and get the flavors and all and then spit it out and rinse your mouth out. Because, see, we're – 
some days we is might. Is that the hardest part about the job? <laughs> <laughs> some days, you know, some days we're tasting it from the day it's made all the way up to the day it's bottled. And uh, so some days you might taste 40 or 50 samples. We'll never taste over five at a time. Of course, uh, they'll set up five samples in the lab, and you go in and taste them, and then go back and do some the other job for 45 minutes, come back and taste five more. Of course, if you sit there and start tasting a lot of them, you're going to kill you. Yeah. Give, you it kill your taste buds, and you want to make sure as it's setting your age in each year that it's meeting your standards and all. Mm-hmm. So when you taste, do you taste that the, you know, the – Straight out of the bar- at barrel proof, or are you tasting at the I like the to, finished watered down product? I like to do it both ways. Most people likes to cut it to forty proof to do their tasting, but I like to taste it at barrel strength and also it's cut down with water some. So you're getting a variation there of what the flavors are. Is there a is there a panel or anything that kind of assists you? Or oh, we is got, five on the panel. Five, here. gotcha. Uh, we got a lot of people in training, so if something that was first something happened to me, we got somebody ready to step in and take over. And we will not taste together. They set up the samples in the lab for us. I go in and taste and do the scoring of them. Eddie will come in behind me or for me, and he'll do the tasting and score them and turn the paper in. Okay, if you're tasting together, you can influence people. Mm-hmm. Even though it's nothing wrong, if I pick up this bottle of water, and something gets my bat in my eye, they're watching it. They think, well, it's something wrong with that. They start looking for things that's not there, so we'll never taste together. Or you could really influence. I was about to say, did you make that mistake at some point in the no, past? And- <laughs> no, I've always, but uh, you can, if you don't believe that, just try it sometimes when you're out. Boy, I taste, hmm, hmm, that tastes like raspberries. First thing you know, somebody said, well, yeah, I taste that too. You, you, you can influence people. Placebo we'll effect. <laughs> well, I think if I'm tasting bourbon with Jimmy Russell, I'm just going to. Yeah, I'm whatever he says goes. Yeah, it's pretty much the master right there. Uh-huh. So I guess uh, kind of we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up. Kind of leave us on a note of, you know, when you want people to come and visit the distillery, what do you want them to experience? I want them to here at the Wild Turkey Distillery. We want you to experience the complete operation. We want you to see the, how it's distilled, how it's fermented, how it's aged, how it's bottled, and everything, and then finish off in the visitor center with tasting four of our products. Let you taste. You know, one's not better than another. See which one you, you know, my taste buds are different from yours. If we all like the same food, it would just be one food out there. You know, everybody has different tastes, different flavors. So I, what I like to see is people come and do different tastings and do the tasting, see what they really like. Not what I like, what they like. And another thing I like to do a lot of times about the group of people with our marketing salespeople or other people, I like to do a blind tasting. I'll put in different products. And you'd be amazed what will happen in that. Uh, People will taste it and taste this one, taste that and taste that. I love this one. Well, you tell them what it is. There's no such thing. You tell what each one of it. I know that's not right because I love that brand there, and that's not the way it tastes. But it, it, in your mind, if you know what you're tasting, oh yeah. But if you're doing a blind tasting, you'd be surprised what'll happen in doing that. Yeah, blind tastings are a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. right. So uh, one last question I kind of want to pose to you. You know, we've we've heard this over and over again in some forums, straight bourbon or whatever, and people say that older turkey is better turkey. You know, whether they get a bottle from the, the 70s and 80s or crack it open, they think it tastes better than today's. Kind of, what, what is your thought on that? It's all, all in your mental. head, right? <laughs> uh, well, the funniest thing about this, you can change a label. And people swear up and down. Who don't taste it. I can tell you a story about this. Many years ago up in Washington, D.C. at a famous bar up there. We changed uh, our labels on our 1.75s. And a lot of the officials was in this bar every night. And they drank. And he bought the 175s at the bar. And he had a new label on it. And they all, that night, that's not what we've been used to drinking. It don't taste the same. Well, our salesperson, the fellow that I knew... They called me and started, I said, it's nothing different in it. And he said, well, I've got an old bottle. He poured it out of the other bottle back in that old label. That night they take, now that's the right stuff. And he told <laughs> me, but you'd be surprised how much effect that has on you. 
and taste it and all. You just change something on the label or something other. Uh, Did you have a favorite label through the years? Uh, well, ours have been basically the same all the time. Only one that had this seven right over there. For many years, the old turkey, his eyes was looking right at you, uh, where it's sideways now. But the eyes was turning right at you. And my favorite story was to tell people, when those eyes started blinking at you, it was time to quit drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty good advice. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. I think we're going to wrap it up on that note. So, Jimmy, I want to say thank you again yeah, for thanks again. coming on the show today and, uh, you know, dropping some wisdom and some good jokes. Uh, this was a pleasure. And like I said, I think a bucket list item for a lot of our listeners out there. Well, thank you all for having me. Enjoy it. You're always welcome here at the Wild Turkey Distillery. Anytime you want to come, all the visitors are always welcome here. And we'll show you, we'll show you everything we do except one thing. We will not tell you our percentage of grain. <laughs> 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 but if you time if you time it right, you might you might catch Jimmy at the gift shop yep. and be able to get your bottle signed at the same exact time. Correct. Yes, I'd be glad to. Awesome. Uh, so again, thank you for being on. If you like what you hear, make sure you support the show on Patreon. That's p a t r e o n dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit. Follow us online on all those great Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram handles at Bourbon Pursuit. And I even hear that Jimmy has a Twitter handle nowadays. <laughs> yeah, do not a tweet. <laughs> You shaking You're his like, head. What the hell's that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thanks I'm, again. I'll go ahead. I'm on it all the time, but <laughs> I'm, I'm an old school. <laughs> that's well, what, that's refreshing. Sometimes, yeah, Eddie, you know. Eddie will say you'll get an email and you'll uh, you'll say you need to you need to CC my assistant on it or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I can read them, but I'm not going to respond to them. <laughs> they know they got my email set up. They know I've read them. <laughs> but you ain't responding back. That's pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but thanks again. I, I really appreciate taking Thank time. Thank you all for your time. Oh, yeah. For spending and, your time to be with us. Really, NSA, you're, anytime, you're always welcome here if you want to come back. Absolutely. We'll take you up on it. Yeah, right. about Saturday for dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, no, guys, if you have any suggestions, comments, feedback, we'd love to hear it from you. And uh, we'll see you next time. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey, and for those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com. Mm-hmm.